Thank you so much for joining us today. Our topic today is about multiple raptures. Multiple. Very interesting. Things that maybe we don't know a whole lot about, but we're here today to hear from you guys. Not just one. Not just In one. The future. Wow. And just when you thought there was nothing else to talk about with <laughs> raptures, and no, there couldn't be another episode, we're going to talk because there is more to say about right. Raptures. That's right. Multiple. There's been multiple throughout history already. People like Enoch and Elijah, they've been taking Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch story. Uh, my favorite is Ezekiel, where he's sitting around with the elders in Babylon. His body stays here, but his spirit's raptured up and taken to Jerusalem. So the prophets were raptured many times when they were taken into heavenly dimensions and, and seen the future of what's about to occur. Well, we want to discuss the distinction, guys, between a rapture that occurs for the bride and a rapture that occurs for the saints near the end of the tribulation. Because as you know, Yeshua talks about a rapture in Matthew 24, and people use that scripture to say, oh, look, there's no rapture. It's just, you know, that kind of rapturish thing that happens at the end of the tribulation. But there's more to the story than meets the eye. <laughs> oh, that's a good line. I yeah. like that. That's good. We now go to their teaching. Stay with us. Hey everybody, I'm Joshua. And I am Caleb. And we're brothers, but we're not just brothers. We're Jewish brothers. <gasps> that makes us so much more special than You're you. You're impressed, I know, I can tell. Well, Hag Sameach, everyone. Shana Tova is the happy new year for you Jewish people. And uh, it's kind of a stressful time, I guess, for our Jewish brethren, those who don't believe in Yeshua. You have to fast, you have to pray, you have to hope that your name is written in that book of life for one more year. But for us believers in Yeshua, it's, it's a time of celebration. Heck we, yes. It leaves us wondering, Josh, could this be the year that Messiah returns for us again? God, I'm so nervous right now. And they're, yeah. probably, <laughs> they're probably right to be nervous. Uh -huh. If you were wondering, is Caleb going to talk about the rapture again? Yeah. Yes. Yes, he is. Because the more he reads, the more he learns, and the more he thinks you need to know about what's about to happen in the rest of the history of mankind. There's been a lot of biblical confusion as of late. People think that there's not going to be a rapture or that, you know, we're just going to have to build that tribulation bomb shelter, you know, start yes. stockpiling supplies. I've been taking so much toilet paper during COVID. But that's because prophecy can be confusing. We want to clarify things in prophecy because God meant for us to understand prophecy. He's not the author of confusion. Um, he says, you are the children of light. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5, and he wants you to be aware at his plans for when he returns. So... Let me blow their mind. You always get to blow their mind. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. There is... How many raptures, you ask? I thought there was only one rapture. Only one rapture? Mm -hmm. No, my friend. There's not only more than one rapture, <gasps> but there's raptures that already happened. <gasps> so, so... There's more than one rapture. There's more than one rapture, and several have already happened. I learned that from reading my brother's notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to Genesis 5.24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not found, for God took him. Bam! Rapture. You got a rapture. That's rapture number one. What about 2 Kings 2.11? Mm -hmm. uh, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Rapture. rapture. Those two guys must be pretty important, I'll tell you what. I mean, I don't know who they might be <laughs> or where you might see them again, uh, but they're pretty cool. I say with, with preterism and post-millennialism post and post-tribulation rapture things going on, uh, a lot of people think you have to endure the tribulation because of some scriptures in the Bible, rightly so. They think every scripture in the Bible about the rapture is the same rapture. Or they've said that you have to endure it so that all the kids in Sunday school will behave. That's right. <laughs> so there's two coming raptures. We want to first talk about the rapture of the Bride of Christ. And indeed, this is a pre-tribulation rapture, Josh. That sounds good to me. First Thessalonians 4, 16-18. through 18. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, mm -hmm. and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Mm -hmm. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. I feel comforted. So important details, guys. Yeshua doesn't step foot on the Mount of Olives this time. He comes in the clouds just as he promised. Uh, we are caught up to be with him in the air, and we're going to marry the Messiah, go to this wedding feast, but first our bodies have to be glorified. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not sleep, 
but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and with this mortal must put on immortality. That's, that's pretty awesome. That last trumpet reference, Josh, that's a direct reference to the Feast of Trumpets. Any Jewish person knows that from the many trumpet blasts that occurred over the two-day time period. Um, but we want to focus on how people believe that those who are in the tribulation, you read in Revelation 13, 10, you hear the term saints, and it says the saints that are taken at the end of the tribulation, well, saints are Christians, in, right? Is that everybody in the stained glass windows in a Catholic church? Exactly. They're all those, taken. Those are the saints that are taken. So people think, okay, saints, that means Christians are enduring the tribulation because they read about saints in Revelation. Well, Psalm 50, verse 5 references saints. This is before the start of the church of Yeshua. Psalm 149, 1 references saints. But that's because saints literally means to be set apart. These are people that are set apart for God for some specific purpose. Now, the only way they are justified and make into heaven is by their faith, their, their act of faith of being beheaded in the tribulation. Then they go to heaven. But they are brought to that witness of believing in Yeshua by the 144,000 and the two uh, prophets. Is this why Jesus was always like, hey, it's probably better you believe by faith instead of by, I don't know, getting your head cut off? Because that's not the most optimal way to believe on him. That, that's true, guys. So the tribulation, guys, it concerns the Jews, but it's meant for the world. It's a time of wrath and judgment that is poured out on the, on the earth. And that's why we're not supposed to endure it. Um, let's get to Matthew 24, because this is a rapture that talks about at the end of the tribulation. This is the one that throws a lot of confusion into people's gears. Uh, because you read in Matthew 24, and Yeshua is talking about the end times, all these events. You get the birth pains that we're living in now. You get uh, sun turning black, moon turning to blood. You get abominations of desolations, all that. They're like, whoa, this is a tribulation. Then he gets to talking about a rapture in verse 31. So Matthew 24, 30 and 31. Yeah, Matthew 24, 30 and 31 says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. And he will send his angels, and with a great sound of a trumpet they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, so his elect, these are the saints that we are talking about. These are those people who choose to believe upon Yeshua during the tribulation. The Jews that choose to believe on him, you know there's a lot of Jews that choose to believe upon Yeshua in the tribulation. They go to a safe place in the wilderness called Basra. My kids watched that show actually for years with the green bear dancing around. No, that's Bas. Dang it. But the point is that uh, for Yeshua to fulfill his own words in 24:13 of Matthew saying, He who endures to the end shall be saved. There has to be a rapture on the great and terrible day of the Lord that saves those people who make it to the end, who aren't beheaded, who survive, who believe upon him. And Zechariah 10:12, 10, 12, um, 12, 10. Zechariah 12:10 12, says that the earth mourns when they see Yeshua in the clouds. That's the same wording we just saw in Matthew 24, 30 through 31. There's all these key events because not only does the earth mourn when they see him, Yeshua touches down on the Mount of Olives. It splits in two. Josh. So how can he be coming like a thief in the night if he splits the Mount of Olives? Isn't that kind of like, hello, I'm here. It's not very sneaky. Well, it's not a surprise at the end of the tribulation because you have two thirds of a population is wiped out. You have all the green grass burned up. You have all the water turned to blood. Angels flying through the atmosphere warning the lamb is coming. The judgment of the lamb is coming. Repent. Don't bow to the beast. So when Yeshua finally comes, they know it's him. The world knows it's him. <laughs> it's pretty clear They're just at that like, point. oh, not him. And they go to war against him. So that's why the whole <sighs> earth is mourning. And that's why it can't be the first rapture when he just comes for us and no one sees him. They just hear that trumpet blast. Can I just build a tribulation? bomb shelter and just hide and then wait till it's all done. Well, with things going on how they are right now, it doesn't hurt to stockpile, but we want you to have confidence and faith that you are going to be taken and, and you are not reserved for that wrath as uh, Messiah promises in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. It says, and wait for his, sons, uh, for his son from heaven, mm -hmm. whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's right. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtaining of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8, we've used that scripture before when Paul is saying that the restrainer, who is the Holy Spirit living within you, keeps the Antichrist from being revealed, that he will not come on this earth as long as we are present. That's how powerful the Spirit of God is in one believer. So you can stop guessing as the Antichrist, George Soros. Wait, it's not? 
or Obama or your, your ex-spouse. We aren't going to know until we are watching from the clouds to find out who it is. And keep in mind, guys, when we talk about prophecy, we get it. Like everybody has an opinion. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks the word says this and this. So instead of taking what we're saying in a combative way where you want to argue it or think it means something different, take it in what Yeshua would have you, which, which is to be prepared. Right. Instead of trying to figure out if there, is there one, is there two, is there seven, let me hold on to the end. Get your life right. Be ready. He's coming back. Mm -hmm. Whether you believe it's before, whether you believe it's after, in the middle, it's time to get your heart right and to know that whenever that trumpet does blow, whenever he does show up, whenever it's your time to go, you're ready. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And you don't have to worry about the beheadings or that stinky bunker smell because bunker smell is no good. It's very mildewy. Yeah, very it's musky. Gross. We love you guys. Grandma's bunker. Please join us next time. This is one of the programs that I just have to say, I say, aha. <laughs> I had no idea about multiple raptures, raptures right. but Arpazzo. aha, yeah. I get we, it. We don't think about that. We think yeah. taken up, I don't know, in the Old, Old Testament, but it's, it, it is fascinating. There have been multiple and we just focus on one, mm. but, well, but there are more. I get yeah, it. To think about the rapture of an individual, we've never probably thought about collectively, but then uh, we usually get the two confused between the first coming of Yeshua and the second coming, right? So yeah. yes. um, we, we talk about how um, Yeshua is going to come for his bride, right? Those of us who believe and accept him as Savior before the tribulation, he's going to come and rapture us away. Yeah. We're going to go, right? But then there's the saints. And I learn from my brother all the time, words matter. Don't say a bride when they're a saint and a saint when they're a bride. They're two very different things. <laughs> the saints are those who believe on Yeshua after after we've been taken away yeah, as the bride. That's right. And on the great and terrible day of the Lord, we ride in as the bride, yeah. right, to fight in Armageddon. We're going to be in slow motion on horses with wind blowing. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. I don't know about the slow motion. <laughs> but that is the second, when, the, when they are raptured that second yes, time, the second coming. There's got to so, be a lot of horses in heaven uh, if everyone's riding a horse. Right. I need a Clydesdale to fight that battle, <laughs> but it's going to happen. But what's, what's sad, what's heartbreaking is, though the saints are raptured at that moment, the Jewish people are not. It's very specific that the remnant of the house of Israel stays behind because they don't believe upon Yeshua. It's not until they look upon him who they have pierced that they finally get, oh, this is the guy, look at those holes in his hands and feet. They finally get it. So they stay behind and they live into the millennial reign. They are his subjects in that kingdom. But now, guys, we're going to talk about a new subject still located uh, within this, this theme of the rapture, the three harvests of Israel. Yeshua taught about it, and it's going to uh, continue the story. You're going to want to watch this. Hey, everybody, I'm Joshua. And I am Caleb. We're brothers. We're guys. Jewish. We are Jewish. We're Jewish. I just thought I'd throw that out to you. In case you were wondering and or curious and or nervous because, yeah. you know, not too long ago we talked about the rapture again. It's probably going to happen again today. That's right. And as with all things, you know, rapture-ish or Jewish-ish, -ish, it involves things like harvests and wheat and barley That's and whatnot. True. So grab your favorite pumpkin spice latte oh. and let's fall into harvest time. Huh? That was a dad joke. I'm I get really one dad joke a month. I get it. It's my quota. And I just, I had the pleasure of being here to watch it happen. It's not that good. Well, any, uh, anyways, guys, there is uh, seven feasts of Israel. You know about that. And God meant for those seven feasts to foreshadow a messianic timeline. But did you know there are three harvests of Israel that coincided with those seven feasts? Because the seven feasts occur, Josh, in spring, summer, and fall season. And the three harvests of Israel occurred at spring, summer, and fall. Wait a minute, that's a coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> it this is not a coincidence, Do you everyone. mean there's not coincidences in the Bible? <laughs> and the reason there was harvest is harvests were, were all, always synonymous with the harvest or gathering of souls mm. uh, of people uh, for eternity. How do we know that's true? We know that because John 4, 35 and 36 says, okay. Don't you say that there are yet four months until the harvest? Mm. Behold, I tell you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, that they are white for harvest already. Mm. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit to eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. So how was Yeshua talking about a harvest back then before his sacrifice was even uh, came to the cross? It's because there's always a first fruits offering to harvest, that grain that matured faster than the others. And so Yeshua himself is our first fruits offering. He was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. We have scripture to back that up. <laughs> we do, because there's scripture to back all of it. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 15, 20 through 23 says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. 
he became the first fruit of those who were asleep. Mm. For since death came by man, the resurrection of the dead also came by man. For as Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then those who are Christ's at his coming. That's right, because the order of a resurrection of souls, of bodies, was always important. Um, as 1 Thessalonians 4 16 states, there's a lineup in the rapture. Those who are dead, who have been waiting patiently, those people who believed in Messiah, they're going to get their bodies glorified first. That's and right. uh, we, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, who are alive and, and see Yeshua in the clouds, then we receive our glorified bodies. But that leads us to the first harvest of the year, Josh. In Israel's agrarian society, during the Passover time, that first harvest was a barley harvest. I was about to say, it was a complex carbohydrate. It doesn't spike your insulin. It's just good for you, like <laughs> good barley, old barley, good old barley harvest. Well, they would gather that barley up and they would they would take a winnowing fork and they would cast into here, you know, the pointy pitchfork. Winnow fork. Winnowing, winnowing. Female minnow, like a little uh, girl fish. A winnowing fork, you know, the, the pitchfork, spiky three inch pitchfork. You should say pitchfork. You gotta go fancy with your terms. I wanna say winnowing because that's what they say in the Bible. It sounds like cool. Words. And, and separation of wheat and chaff from the barley. So that was, that is the first rapture, the rapture of the bride of Messiah, separated we the grain from the chaff and everything, the refuse that's left on earth. But the second feast we're gonna to get to is the wheat harvest. And there's no chaff refuse in that? Well, there is, there is segregation in that <laughs> always harvest as well. Uh, the wheat harvest, guys, this happened during the summer, during the time of Shavuot. Though Shavuot, the feast was fulfilled with the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the believers. Um, during the tribulation, there's gonna be a threshing of wheat. Uh, people are gonna get the opportunity to become one of the wheat kernels or to become that chaff. Well, that leads us to what is the wheat harvest and how was it threshed, Josh? Uh, there was the stalks of grain that were gathered. They were placed on a threshing floor and you'd have what was called a tribulum, a sled a wooden sled that would be uh, put weights on that sled and the, the donkey would pull and it would crush that wheat and separate it from the stalks and the chaff. I've got to be honest with you. Yeah. I'm picturing this right now mm -hmm. and it sounds kind of like an anti-Santa Claus. You've got a fat man in a sled <laughs> crushing wheat, tribulum, tribulum. Is that anything to do with tribulation? I mean, it sounds tribulum, tribulation, is that? It, it absolutely does. That's where we get the term tribulation from. We read Smart. guys in first, Chronicles 2120, there's King David and Ornon the Jebusite at the threshing floor. And we get to hear how this tribulum sled works and he purchases a threshing floor and he offers a sacrifice to God. That threshing floor becomes the foundation of King Solomon's temple. But that, yes, that intense pressure, as Josh said, is where we get the term tribulation from, mm. the pressure, the stress. Um, those saints that are surviving the tribulation endure the stress of the beast torment, hunting them down, trying to murder them, trying to behead them, um, or they can accept reprieve and get the mark of the beast and bow to his image. Then they become the, the chaff, they become the refuse of that stalks. And um, you thought taxes were stressful. This is far more stressful. It, it's very important. Uh, those saints are described in Revelation 14, yep. 12 through 13. Here is the perseverance of the saints, those yes. who keep the commandments of God mm -hmm. and the faith of Jesus. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, for their works follow with them. So those are the tribulum wheat kernels that survive under that intense pressure. It was the same thing, guys, during the time of the law. That weight of the law was heavy. They endured that stress. Are they going to mess up? Do we have to offer sacrifices? Are they going to make it? And it's funny, even John the Baptist uses that end of days, uh, second harvest, which yes, occurs at the end of a rapture on the great day of judgment on the battle of Armageddon to describe that harvest of wheat. In Matthew 3, 11 through 12, it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you and with the Holy Spirit and fire, his winnowing fork, it is in there. <laughs> his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will be clear his threshing floor, mm. gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff mm. with unquenchable fire. So we got two harvests, two raptures that were mentioned. Then what's the third harvest, guys? The third harvest occurred in the fall time. That was the harvest of grapes that occurred during the time of Yom Kippur. And this was always synonymous with that great and terrible day of the Lord. Which is Yom Kippur? Which is the judgment? Which is all for, those things put together? That's for God's people, right? No, this third, har 
third harvest is not for God's people, it's actually for a world. Mm. The, the harvest of souls of a world of non-believers. This, this is spoken about in Revelation 14, mm. 14 through 20. Mm -hmm. I looked and I saw a white cloud, and on the cloud one sitting like a son of man, mm. having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat in the cloud, Send your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. He who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar, he who has power over fire, and he called with a great voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Send your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the earth's grapes are fully ripe. The angel thrust his sickle into the earth in the gathering the vintage of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress even to the bridles of the horses as far as 1,600 stadia. What does all that mean, guys? I have <laughs> never seen that much stadia of blood in my life. It's a lot of stadia. What is a stadia? What it's talking about is that harvest of souls is the wrath of Yeshua. He comes down and he slices and dices, guys. Everybody in the Battle of Armageddon, they are wiped out. Yes, their physical bodies are wiped out. Then the souls of those who are gathered in the last two harvests are taken to the judgment of the sheep and goats in the Valley of Decision, in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And there, the sheep and goats are separated. Sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell fire. It's, it's, it's a harsh judgment. It's, and God has to judge because He is good, because He is just. Uh, because of those souls that are beheaded during the tribulation, they cry out for judgment, avenge our murderers. And God says, just hold on. I'll have my time of judgment. And, and that's what these harvests are all about, guys. And it's sad to say that the Jews, uh, the whole house of Israel that says, when they look upon him whom they have pierced, uh, that's because they don't believe upon Yeshua. They actually don't make it in all these harvests. It's not until the very last second on, when Yeshua steps on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two. He provides a safe way for them to escape out of Jerusalem. Ah. That river of God flows out. He's probably walking on that water as they see him in there swimming in that water and they see the holes and they say, oh, it is Jesus. It is Yeshua. And so we we don't want to be part of that, no. those last two judgments. I want to be part of that barley harvest. That's the coolest harvest of them all. We escape all that wrath and terrible things in the tribulum. See, see guys, God is good enough to give you mm -hmm. the information. Yes, He put it in a way that was hard for the wicked to understand, but then He gave it so that we could understand it, That's and He right. gave us these We're details. And it may seem confusing to you, and then again, I said this last time we talked about the rapture. Yeah. Instead of trying to just focus on, is this right? Is this, you know, how many stadia of blood will there will be? You can't question that. That's actually in the Word. <laughs> but my point is, be in the first group. That's right. Be in the first harvest. Why would you want to go through all that other stuff? Mm. There, there people will be. The That's Word right. says it. But what we are here today to do is to try to show you the truth so that you will be compelled to be in that first group that doesn't have to endure the beheadings and doesn't have to endure the tribulations mm -hmm. and doesn't have to literally wait till you see Yeshua's holes in his hands that's and right. mountain splitting and water walking to actually go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> yeah, that's the guy. So we want you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeshua wants you. He wants you in that first group. He wants that's you there right. with him, and he wants you to be cheering on everybody else. And so that's what we encourage you today. Put down the doubt, fear, and unbelief, mm. and just believe. And we love you guys. Thanks for joining us today. Please see you uh, next time. So a stadium. Stay tuned. Is that like a stadium, like a football stadium in Europe? Like 1,600 and... Dude, that's like the whole Valley of Armageddon. I've seen it. I've been there. It's a lot. That's a lot of blood. That's like you're swimming in blood. You're swimming. The horsies, they're, they're, they're okay. It's up to your neck and blood. It's not okay. blood. These aren't Shetlands either. These no, are baby no. horses. <laughs> These are the big ones. The big beer horses. I was like, dang it. <laughs> not beer horse height. <laughs> so bad. I think sometimes we look at the parables and think they're nice stories, but Yeshua, Jesus, mm -hmm. wanted to give us a heads up. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. He's like, hey, this sounds like a, a story, but this is something that's for real. And Yeshua said the people have hard hearts. So he had to tell them in stories to get through that back door that would be in their head. They would, they would see that symbolism and hopefully be set free. He didn't want them to be unprepared. He wanted them to choose their harvest. Barley good, wheat, 
oh, it's so good, grape bad. And so it's really our choice uh, what part we want to play in Yeshua's kingdom and what we're going to suffer. It's always been about our choice. He gave us that free will and we need to choose what's right. I, I was, I, I don't mean to jump in there. I, I just appreciate that he spoke in a way to his people right yeah. there in a way that they could understand. I mean, we That's need right. that too. Yeah. But he did that because he's good. Mm -hmm. And we often get caught up with the Bible and we think this is so hard to understand, there's no point in trying. But the Father has given us so many opportunities to understand. He made the Bible so the child could understand it. He made it so no super genius could claim that he understands it all. But the whole point of having his word was to lead all people to him. Mm. If you're a good dad, you want your children to spend eternity with you. You don't want any of them eternally separated. And Yeshua wants you to spend eternity with him. Whatever you've been hurt with, whatever you haven't understood, whatever you thought of church or anything else in the past, or maybe you're a Jewish person and you've never believed that Yeshua was the Messiah. He is your Messiah. And today is the day to open up your heart and to choose Him. And when that, when that veil is removed, it's all going to become clear and you'll spend an eternity with Him. Guys, thank you for your teaching today. I just am thinking about our next tour to Israel. You guys get to go with us. Yes, sir. And it's going to be life-changing for all of us, and we would love for you to join us. Life-changing for you. Pray about going with us, and uh, you can find all the information on Levitt.com. We'll be right back. Our resource this week, The End, written by Mark Hitchcock. This 500-page hardcover book is made available to you for your generous donation to Zola Levitt Ministries. The accompanying bookmark by Joshua and Caleb provides important scripture from God's Word concerning The End. Please remember, we depend on your generous gifts, which allow us to bring timely updates regarding Bible prophecy and the end of days. Thank you so much for your continuous support of this ministry. Our viewers have kept us on the air for 45 years. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Spreading the Thank good you, news, the Jewish roots, the two of you, of Christianity. What an incredible voice we've had and... Our, our viewers have made that possible. We're so thankful for them. Can't believe it's time to go already, but we end with... That's right, guys. Never forget, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now on our social media sites for exclusive content. Visit our website, levitt.com, for tour information, broadcast schedule, free monthly newsletter, and online store. Call us anytime at 1-800-WONDERS and ask about this week's resource. Our Jewish Roots is a presentation of Zola Levitt Ministries. Partner with us. As a 100% viewer-funded ministry, your gifts allow us to bring you our weekly television series, social media outlets, website, and other ministry endeavors. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.